would join me in prayer. Our Father, as we uh, now, Lord, quiet our hearts to hear from your word, I pray, Lord, that you would make us hungry today. Hungry, Lord, for your wisdom. Lord, hungry to understand who we are and who you are. And Lord, what it means to walk with you, what it means, Lord, to be loved by you, Lord, what it means to be changed by you. So, Father, today we pray that you'd give us wisdom and understanding beyond what we have. And Lord, give us the the grace today to receive that wisdom so that, Lord, it would form us and change us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I'd like to talk to you about, about wisdom. Uh, we are continuing our, our study of 1 Corinthians, and we're in chapter 2 today of, of wisdom. And I want to start by asking you a question. Don't you have to answer it out loud, but I want you to think about this. Who is someone in your life that you consider to be very wise? I hope you can think of someone. Um, think about for a moment what makes that person come to mind. What makes a person wise? We're going to talk a little bit about this. In the Bible, you can find a description of wisdom, many descriptions of wisdom, but none may be as clear as the one that you find in the Old Testament in the book of Proverbs. Did you know that in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, which is a book of wisdom, it's part of what the the Jewish people call the wisdom literature, that wisdom is it's given in its epitome as personified in a mom. Proverbs 31, a godly woman uh, is, is the epitome of wisdom. In Proverbs, we read about this, this godly woman that comes at the end of this book of wisdom literature as a, a woman that is hardworking and honorable and honest. And she loves and takes care of her family. She works hard to take care of her family, to provide for them. She's compassionate towards other people. She has a heart for helping people in need, her neighbors, whether they're in poverty or have some material need. Uh, Her children recognize how wonderful she is to them and, and how much she loves them and they call her blessed. Her husband recognizes uh, how lucky he is to have her and he rises and he calls her blessed. And in the, most of all, in Proverbs 31, of course, what is that very last attribute that that godly woman has, the one that's more precious than jewels, a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised above all others. I'm fortunate to have a mom that fits that category and to be married to a wife who is the mother of our children who fits that category. Now, when you thought about wisdom, how many of you thought about your mom? I'll bet some of you did, didn't you? We're going to talk today about wisdom, and I've got good news for you today, okay? The good news today is this. Every single one of us in this room today can have more wisdom than we could even imagine, right? That wisdom is available, readily accessible to every single one. Does anyone here today, let's let's be humble... Would anyone here today like to to be wise, wiser than you are? I will raise my hand the highest and keep it up the longest. And so this passage we're going to read is one of my favorites. It's an amazing thing. I'd like to read today from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 6, reading through the end of the chapter. Again, 1 Corinthians 2, 6 to 16. As we talk about the cross as the source of wisdom beyond what we can imagine. This is God's word, listen, as we read together. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had... It would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. 
For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of this world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person discerns all things, judges all things, but is himself judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Hear that last phrase again and remember it. But we have the mind of Christ. So we saw last week that Paul distinguishes between what the world calls wisdom and what is truly wisdom. Let's think for a moment about what the world would call wisdom. Because it's helpful for us if we're going to seek wisdom to really know what it is. When we think about wisdom in the world, we might think about someone like Bill Gates. Right? Super nerdy. Uh, incredibly smart, invents things we all use. Or we might think about Jeff Bezos, super rich and super smart, more money than, than you would know what to do with. Uh, my son told me this week, he said that if you earned $180,000 a day, they talked about this at school, if you earned $180,000 a day, every day from the time that Jesus lived until now, you wouldn't have as much as Jeff Bezos. The owner of Amazon. And I thought, that's not possible. And I got out my calculator. Then I had to get a calculator that had more zeros. And I did it. And it's true. In fact, you wouldn't even have barely more than half of what Jeff Bezos has. 2,000 years, 180 grand a day. Isn't that crazy? We might think about, we think about wisdom, someone like Stephen Hawking. Have you all heard of Stephen Hawking? He died a couple of years ago. He was one of the most, uh, considered one of the most brilliant minds scientifically. He was an expert in physics and cosmology and all these other areas. So, but if we take all of those things that the world uses to define wisdom, whether you're in inventing technology or making obscene amounts of money or mastering all manner of scientific study, all of that kinds of stuff, the truth is that might make you smart or it might make you really rich or it might mean you are highly educated but none of that, according to Paul in the Scripture, would actually equate to wisdom. Because wisdom is different. According to Paul, true wisdom is coming to understand something that it was formerly hidden. It was a mystery. And only God knew it. Right? Do you realize that? That we have the ability to know something that in ages past, no one could conceive, and God was the only one who knew it. And that, of course, we are talking about the mystery of Jesus, of God's plan to send His Son in order to save us from our sin and to redeem creation from its fall, right? So in Christ, God's power and wisdom is revealed, where God is both able to be merciful but just, righteous but forgiving in coming up with a way to save us and to redeem us and the whole of creation. That's the wisdom that Paul calls the wisdom of the cross. And listen, it is something that at one point no eye had seen, no ear had heard, no heart could have imagined. You have to think, if before you heard the gospel, before anyone had heard the gospel, before Jesus came, if you had asked every person in the world, how can God fix the creation? How can God restore it? No one would have said, by sending his son to die on a cross, right? Inconceivable. But we know this message now that is the wisdom and the power of God. Sadly, many people miss it, including some of the ones the world thinks 
to be the most wise of all. I mentioned Stephen Hawking, who was considered probably the smartest man to live when he lived. Stephen Hawking wrote these words, There is no God, no one created the universe, no one directs our fate. And this leads me to a profound realization, there is probably no heaven and no afterlife either. So we have this one life to appreciate the grand design of the universe, and for that I am extremely grateful. What? Stephen Hawking said, there is no designer, there's no God, and so the answer is to spend this one life appreciating the grand design? That doesn't make sense. And I'm not as smart as Stephen Hawking, I'm only just about 80% as smart as he was. That's, that's a joke. No, but seriously, do you see how the smartest man alive can at the same time say things that don't make sense? What I think is that Stephen Hawking, like all of us, had a part of him that simply could not deny that there is transcendence in the universe. He couldn't deny it as hard as he tried. So he would say in one breath, there is no God, there's no creator, there's no designer in the next. We should appreciate the grand design. If he were honest, he would say, there is no design, there is nothing grand about it. It's all simply a coincidence of random actions and it is what it is. Anyway, Paul says, however... And there's a condition for those that are wise. Paul says, to those who love God, okay, there's a starting point. If you deny God and you don't want there to be a God and you wouldn't love God if there was, don't expect his wisdom. But to those who are simply humble enough to love him and to believe in him, to believe his message of power and wisdom in Jesus Christ, to that person, a miracle happens. God gives his spirit. What a miracle that is. Don't ever forget this reality, that if you are a Christian, you are walking around as God's dwelling place and His Spirit is alive in you. It is an amazing thing. Don't, don't let your sins or your shortcomings or your struggles or your weaknesses ever let you forget that God's Spirit lives in in you. That is the blessing he gives to every single person that believes in Jesus Christ. Now, who knows you the best? I look around and I, I see Lewis and Susan Taylor. And if I said, Su Lewis, who knows you the best? He might say Susan does. Or Lori might say that I know her the best or something like that. But the reality is there's someone that knows us better than our spouse. You know, uh, Susan can know what kind of things Lewis does. She can predict what he might say. She knows his habits and she knows the words he says. But only Lewis knows what's going on up here, right? And only Lori knows her thoughts, right? Sometimes we probably wouldn't want to know a person that well, right? I've, I've got a good friend. He gave me such great advice when I was younger. He said, Eric, if you're ever mad or troubled when people talk bad about you, he said, just imagine what they'd say if they really knew you. And I thought, you know, there's some truth to that. Well, Paul says, it's the same way with God. No one really comprehends God except who? The Spirit of God. In the same way that no one knows you as well as the Spirit of you that lives, you know yourself, Paul says, no one knows God except God's Spirit. But here's the good news. His Spirit lives in His people. So what does that mean? Well, Paul says it like this. Therefore, we have the mind of Christ. Brothers and sisters, this is incredible. Don't miss this. Now, I want to talk for a moment today about what the mind of Christ is not, what it doesn't mean when Paul says we have the mind of Christ, and what it does mean. Because I think we can want it to mean different things that it doesn't. And we can miss out as long as we insist on trying to make it mean something it doesn't. And we will, we will be blessed when we understand what it does mean and begin to embrace that. So the first thing that having the mind of Christ does not mean for Christians is this. It doesn't mean constant commands. All right, We wish that that's what it meant. Right? We are used to Google. When we need an answer, we are used to picking up the phone 
and typing or saying, okay, Google, or if you're an Apple user, there might be a few of you, uh, you say Siri or whatever, you talk to your phone, right? We're used to getting answers whenever we need it. That is not what the mind of Christ means. It does not mean God is constantly going to tell you at every step what to do, does it? Right? Now, let's use an analogy why that's a good thing, that that's not how God works. We've got lots of dads in here. Let's take our moms. It's Mother's Day, right? So we've got a lot of moms. Now, no mom in here raises her children hoping for the day when her children are grown up that they will call her every time they have to make any decision about anything. Right? Hello? Hey, Mom, I was just wondering, what should I eat for breakfast today? Okay, son, you're 71. Um, you've been at this a while, you know. Ring, ring, ring. Mom, uh, it's Eric. I was just getting ready for work. What do you think I ought to wear today? Right? No mother nurtures her child hoping they will forever need to be told all the time what to do. But sometimes as Christians, that's what we want from God. We just, oh, if God would just tell me what to do all the time, I'd do it, Right? No. Most mothers, what they do is they invest in nurturing children. When they're infants, they give them everything they need. They understand an infant can do nothing for himself or herself. Then as they become toddlers, they, they begin to give the children a little bit of responsibility, right? And then as they become teenagers, they entrust more responsibility. And if the child shows they're responsible, they'll entrust them more and more and more. And eventually the hope is when your child is grown, it's not that the mother doesn't want to be involved. It's not that she doesn't love them. It's not that she's not there when they need something. It is that she expects now that they're grown and mature, they will know how to live in a way that pleases me. They will know what I was working toward all those years, right? So this is the way it works with our Heavenly Father. God does not give us wisdom by constantly telling us exactly what to do, but rather He invests in nurturing us and implanting His life in us so that it becomes natural for us to do the things that our Father would want us to do. Another thing the mind of Christ is not is automatic. So listen, let's all say amen. When you or I or anyone else, when we, when we said, God, I, I place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I confess my sin, uh, I, I ask for salvation, save me, how many of us became instantly completely wise? Nobody, right? We have the mind of Christ. God's spirit is perfectly wise. But that wisdom is not automatic in our lives the minute we become Christians. We have a lot of things to unlearn. We have a lot to learn. And God asks us to be participants in the process of wisdom. And this is important. Over and over and over in the Bible, the Bible says that we have a part to play when it comes to the mind of Christ being what leads us. The Bible says, for example, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of what? Your minds. So we've got to renew our minds. We've got to undo the old things we, we believe, the old habits we developed before we, we were becoming mature as Christians. The Bible says we are to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. It means I have an ongoing responsibility, as, as I think, to weigh whether or not those thoughts are obedient to Jesus. Are they the truth? And if they're not, I recognize them and I take them captive. I, I lock them away, right, as I renew my mind by focusing on the Lord, studying His Word, praying, learning, growing. The Bible says, whatever's good and excellent and praiseworthy and beautiful, set your minds on these things, right? We have a part to play. And so much of the time, do you know what I do with my mind? I waste it. I sit there on my phone or I watch TV when I have nothing better to do. Much of my time is, is spent letting my mind be distracted by other things rather than having it set upon things that really matter. So the mind of Christ is not constant commands. It is not automatic. Rather, God wants to give and is willing to give his mind to willing obedient and interested participants. But if you're not interested, God does not force it. But if you are, he does not withhold it. Rejoice in that. The last thing that the mind of Christ is not, it is not absolute knowledge about everything, right? 
You know what would be terrible would be to, to pastor a church where everyone knew everything. We call people like that know-it-alls, right? That's not what it means to have the mind of Christ. It does not mean now that as much as I wish, and this is a struggle for me, that I'm right about everything all the time. Um, in fact, God doesn't give us wisdom about everything. Verse 12 is very key here in chapter 2. Let me read that verse to you again. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given by God. God does not give us everything. He doesn't give us all knowledge. A person may come to me, this would not be unusual, to say, Eric, I need to talk to you, Pastor. Um, help me to understand why God let my loved one die. Or help me to understand why I lost my job. Or can you tell me why God let me get sick or something like that? I cannot answer those questions. Because I don't have all of the knowledge of God. You can't answer all of those questions. So look, let's accept that when the Bible says we have the mind of Christ, it doesn't mean we will always know everything, right? And it's not just the, the hard things in our own lives, it's, it's creation. You can ask me, or I can ask you, is there life on other planets? You know what the answer is? We don't know. Haven't found any. That's as far as I can go. How many planets are there? Who wants to tell me, right? There are things you won't know. And you might pray your whole life, God, let me know if there's life on other planets, and God may never address that for you because it might not matter. But God is perfectly willing to give us what we need to know. And that's an important thing. So the mind of Christ is not constant commands, automatic knowledge where we don't participate, or knowledge about everything. But what is the mind of Christ? Let's think about that for a moment. What it is, instead of constant commands, it is God's constant presence and his constant guidance. Not always verbal words, not every, every time you ask you get an answer. But it is that God's spirit dwells in us to guide us our whole lives and to draw us closer to him, and to let us grow to know him more and more and more, because that's the, the really important thing, to let us learn what it means to love other people well, and how to live and succeed in the ways that God cares about. And his Holy Spirit is there to do that with us constantly and forever, because God will never take his Holy Spirit away from you. So I say it is constant presence, constant guidance. Paul says in Ephesians 4.30, By the Holy Spirit of God, believers, Christians, are sealed for the day of redemption. How long is God's Holy Spirit with you? Forever. The Holy Spirit seals you for the last day, keeps you forever and ever. And so rejoice that God, though he may not be telling you what to do every second, he is always with you and he never leaves you and he never forsakes you. And you know what this means? In some ways, this means we are free even when we fail and even when we don't know what to do to rejoice, to be happy, to be content, because nothing can separate us from the love and the presence of God. So the mind of Christ is constant guidance. It is not automatic, but it is accessible all the time. There's a difference. James chapter 1 has this well-beloved and known verse, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him do what? Let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. God's not waiting to find fault. And if you do that, God will give it to you. Now see, what we would prefer is not to have to ask. We would prefer it be automatic, but it's not. So what we do is we have to practice faith. We have to ask. We have to trust. We have to walk. We have to obey. We have to seek. We have to renew our minds. We have to pray all of those things. Now, I want to encourage you. Some of you will say, you know what? I had important decisions to make, and I prayed, and I fasted, and I asked, and I sought, and God never answered me. That's okay. Listen. Don't assume silence on God, from God on a particular question you've got means that, that you don't have the spirit or you don't have the mind of Christ or something like that. Years ago, I read a, a devotional by Oswald Chambers, a famous devotional, My Utmost for His Highest. And I'll never forget how encouraged I was by this devotional because, Oswald, because I've struggled with that. You seek, you ask, and you feel like you never get an answer. Oswald Chambers says, sometimes 
It is the ones that God trusts the most that he is willing to remain silent with about particular matters. That really it would be the weaker person that God would always have to answer and have to respond and have to to do that in a way that was so clear. He said sometimes God has plans beyond what you understand. He's wanting to do something in your life that is, is further and deeper than you get. And that requires that him to be silent. And he'll only do that if he trusts you to continue to walk in faith and to grow through it. So be encouraged. But understand, the mind of Christ does not always mean you're going to feel like you know exactly what you're doing. In fact, oftentimes the mind of Christ is, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I will follow and seek the Lord. Right? Because God cares about us growing in obedience and in faith. Lastly, the mind of Christ, we said it is not all knowledge, but it is this. It is all the knowledge that we need. There's a big difference there. Second Peter verse 1, 3 has this, this interesting verse. God's divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. Now again, listen, He has given us all things? No but all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. See, there are some things that are really important to God. Part of wisdom is learning to make those things important to me, right? One of the hardest struggles is when I insist to God that this thing is the most important thing, And I feel the whole time like God is absent and I don't have wisdom and he's not helping me, right? So if Eric decides the most important thing in life is owning a new Mercedes, which many preachers Sunday mornings are telling people, just have faith so God will give you a new Mercedes, right? Let me tell you today, I'm not that kind of preacher. God might want you to keep driving your used uh, Yugo, right? And if you're still driving one, we'll pray for you before we leave. But God doesn't give us everything we ask for, including the wisdom we ask for about everything. But he will do this. He will give you everything you need for life, the life that he puts you in your path, the day-by-day challenges you face. God will give you everything you need for life and for godliness because he cares about that. Growing to know him, to know his love, to know that you are forgiven, to know that God has purposes for you, to know that you are going to spend eternity with him and he wants you to be ready for that. He wants you to grow. He wants you to know what it means to love other people and to receive love from other people and all of these kind of things and to walk without guilt and shame and all of that kind of thing, to have hope no matter what happens. God cares about Those kinds of things. He does not give us all knowledge, but he gives us everything we need. So today, I want to close by reiterating the good good news today. God gives us wisdom beyond what we can imagine. Beyond what we can imagine. It will not mean that you will always be the smartest man or woman or student in the room, frankly. I'm rarely the smartest man in the room, even when it's just me, right? But there's something better than being the smartest person in the room. That is a wisdom that comes when you possess something that only God understood but he has revealed to us. And it is the something that can save us and guide us and equip us for everything we need in life. We have the very mind of Christ. Let us thank God today. Lord, we come humbly today. Lord, humbly because we so often don't realize the treasure that you've given to us in planting your Holy Spirit to live in us, in taking up residence in us. And Lord, in giving us the Spirit that understands you completely. Lord, indeed, we have the mind of Christ. But God, I pray today you'd forgive us for wanting that to mean things that it doesn't mean. And Lord, for striving after that. Lord, for for spending a lot of time fighting you for that to mean that you will tell us exactly what we ask and Lord, you will explain the things we think we need to know when much of the time those things don't matter too much at all. 
So, Lord, my prayer is today that in this wisdom you've given to us that is beyond imagination, you would begin to instruct us anew, Lord, what it means to be wise, to believe the promise that we have access to your mind all the time, and, Lord, for us to set our minds on the things that really matter. Father, I thank you that you give this to people like me and people like us that do not deserve it. Lord, today, let us believe this message that we have the mind of Christ. And Lord, do not let us waste this treasure. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.